Welcome once again to Jesus or Muhammad. If you believe in Jesus or Muhammad or neither, this is a great place to be because we're going to discuss issues related uh, to Jesus. We're going to discuss issues related to Muhammad. We're going to uh, discuss why people should believe certain things about both of these men. And uh, we invite callers on the program. We won't be getting to the callers till later because we really want to get through some of our material. Tonight we're beginning a series on the claims of Dr. Zakir Naik. Uh, lots of times when I post a video or post a debate or uh, post some claim about Islam or Christianity, Muslims will come up in the, in the comments section and say, ah, but you would never say this to Zakir Naik. Why don't you, why don't you debate Zakir Naik on this? Would we love to do that, Sam? Definitely. In fact, I've actually met Zachar Naik face to face years ago when he was in Chicago mm -hmm. to debate William Campbell, and I pretty much challenged him to a public debate. And so now people are hearing this, <clears throat> it's going to be archived. I actually challenged Dr. Zachar Naik to debate me and face me in a public forum so he can challenge his assertions. And his response to me was that I must draw at least one million people to hear one of my lectures before he even considers me a serious challenge. Uh huh. One million people. <laughs> and uh, uh, as far as Zakhar Naik's other debates, I've seen him debate local pastors and evangelists yeah. and so on. Would any of the people that he's ever debated in his entire career, and there are only a few, yeah. would any of these men have ever drawn a crowd of a million people? Definitely not. Anywhere close to it? None. In fact, out of everyone that Zakhar Naik has ever faced in his entire debate career, I've only even heard of one of these people. And that was only because he'd written a book, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. More how many, Kevin, yeah. out of everyone Zakhar Naik has ever faced, how many experienced Christian debaters, Christian debaters who've been in at least several debates, have that kind of experience? How many people has he faced that, would be, that we would consider experienced debaters? None. How, yeah. how many people has he faced that we would consider our champions? None. Never None. even come close, right? Not even one, no. So Muslims actually think of this man as a champion debater who's refuted Christians, and he's never faced... The best, one yeah. experienced Christian debater. Yeah. How did he get this reputation? He hasn't even faced what we would consider a semi-decent Christian debater, yeah. let alone the best that mm -hmm. our side has to offer. And we're not, we're not criticizing the people he has debated, right? We're, 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 we're pointing out that these are not experienced debaters, right? Just as I could pull a Muslim off the street and debate him and just obliterate him in a heartbeat, um, that wouldn't prove whether Muslims can actually defend their positions, right? You'd have to get someone who's experienced, who can think quickly, who can keep notes and so on. You need certain skills to be an effective debater. Yeah. And if you want to know if your claims can stand up to scrutiny, you'd have to face someone like that. Zakhar Naik has never faced someone like that. Yeah. And yet he has this reputation. It, it reminds me of you know, a, a local guy walking around bragging that he's the best boxer in the world. <laughs> you say, really? Who have you faced? Have you faced Pacquiao? Have you faced Mayweather? Who have you faced? I haven't faced anyone, but I'm the greatest boxer in the world. Wait, you've never faced any of the other great boxers in the world, and yet you're great? How would we ever know? And that's the position with Zakhar Naik. We'll never know. We'll never know whether he could stand his ground on stage, and I can guarantee you he wouldn't, based on the level of his arguments and the absurdity of his arguments. I can say, beyond a shadow of a doubt, Zakhar Naik, if he ever stepped on stage with an experienced Christian debater, would get obliterated. Yeah. He would get obliterated. Yeah. Exactly. There are Muslim debaters out there uh, who have skills, who have debate skills. Zakhar Naik isn't one of them. Zakhar Naik isn't one of them. And so one of the areas where this is most clear, where this is most obvious, is his position on the crucifixion of Jesus. Would you agree? 100%. Yes. 100%. And don't take our word for it. We are going to examine this issue very carefully. We're going to look at some clips, some videos of Dr. Zakhar Naik, the sorts of things that he says when he gives presentations on uh, the crucifixion of Jesus. And we're going to see just how absurd this is. You know, it's one thing for a Muslim to say, uh, all your Christian texts have been corrupted, something like that. It's another to say what Zakhar Naik says, the Bible itself. The Bible itself shows that Jesus didn't die by crucifixion. You open up the Bible and you read it accurately, you will realize that according to your own scriptures, Jesus never died. And Zucker's position is that Jesus was put on the cross. He says according to the Bible, doesn't mean he actually believes it, but he says according to the Bible, Jesus was put on the cross, never died. Later on, Mary Magdalene went and massaged him in his tomb. He snapped out of it, apparently. Uh, he was living in this tomb as some kind of apartment. And later on, he went out, and this is the position of 
the Bible. Now, just before we get into the, the, the claims about the Bible, we want, especially our Christian viewers, to be aware of the Muslim view because it is disturbing. In fact, if we didn't know anything else, if we didn't know anything else, we would have to reject Islam on this alone. According to Islam, Sam, where did Christians get the idea that Jesus died by crucifixion? Because Christians around the world, Christians down through history have believed that Jesus died by crucifixion. Muslims say it never happened. According wow. to the Quran, Surah 4, verse 157, it never happened. Jesus never actually died and he was never crucified. So if Jesus didn't die by crucifixion, and yet Christians believe that he did, where did we get this false belief? Yeah, well, um, where we got it from is from Allah himself, if you believe <clears throat> the testimony of the Quran, uh, because there's two things to note. And as, as we delve into this topic, it's my habit to always invoke the grace and mercy and the power of our Lord Jesus Christ. I beg the Lord Jesus to anoint you and me, especially tonight, and for every se session, to speak in the power of the Holy Spirit, to speak truth clearly and accurately, protect us from error, and to speak it solely for the glory of Jesus as he purifies our motives, so that Christians get strengthened and Muslims get convicted and repent of this falsehood and embrace Jesus as their Lord and Savior. So we beg the Lord Jesus for a powerful anointing of his spirit so that he'll be magnified in Jesus' name. Now, <clears throat> where do they get this from? Well, two things to note from what the Quran says. You mentioned that the Quran says in chapter 4, verse 157, that the Jews boasted that they killed Jesus, the Messiah, the son of Mary, the apostle of Allah. The response to that assertion, Jews in dialogue with Muhammad, claiming that, you know, we killed our Messiah. And you can comment on absurdity of a Jew going around boasting that he killed his Messiah. But the response to that assertion is that they neither killed him nor crucified him, but it so appeared unto them. It was made to appear unto them as such. What in the world does that mean? Well, if you look at some of your oldest commentators, in fact, if you look at Ibn Kathir's commentary, specifically on chapter 3 of the Quran, verse 55, chapter 3, verse 55, as well as the commentary on that particular text, and chapter 4 of the Quran, verses 157 to 158, he mentions a tradition that goes back to Ibn Abbas. Now, for the people who don't know who Ibn Abbas is, Ibn Abbas is considered to be one of the greatest Muslim scholars, one of the most knowledgeable Muslims who ever lived, he invented because, it. In he fact, invented Quranic studies. Yeah. And, and on top of that, not only is he one of the greatest Muslim scholars and one of the most knowledgeable, he was a companion of Muhammad because he was Muhammad's first cousin. According to him, a tradition that goes back to him, on the night of Jesus' arrest and betrayal, he asked the disciples which one of them would volunteer to look like him and take his place in death. Did you get that? Mm -hmm. the, according to the tradition, the youngest one said, I'll, I volunteer to look like you. So then miraculously... Allah made the youngest disciple look exactly like Jesus from head to toe. Jesus escaped through a hole in the roof and entered into paradise. And then when the people entered the room, they thought they were looking at Jesus, when in reality, they were looking at that disciple who was miraculously transformed by Allah to look exactly like Jesus and killed him in the place of Jesus. So according to this tradition, Jesus didn't die in our place. Someone died in Jesus' place to spare him and save him mm -hmm. from dying on the cross. So the question is, who made it look like they killed Jesus? Allah. Allah. So then who foisted upon the world this Christian teaching that Christ died on the cross, especially for sinners? Allah did. <laughs> that's, that's your answer. Mm -hmm. So who made it appear that way? Who, who started this uh, teaching that Jesus died on the cross? Well, according to the earliest evidence that we have from Jesus' first disciples, all of them testify. The New Testament documents are a set of first century documents that come from either the eyewitnesses to Christ or their followers, mm -hmm. either Jesus' disciples or the followers of Jesus' disciples. So this is eyewitness testimony. And without exception, there's not a single book of the New Testament, 27 books of the New Testament, affirm and reaffirm that Jesus was killed by crucifixion because he came to die on the cross in place for sinners. But if we believe the Muslim version of history, the reason why the disciples of Christ and their followers believe this is because Allah deceived them into thinking Jesus died when in reality it wasn't him. And I just have to say, from a theological perspective, once you introduce an omnipotent deceiver yeah. who has no qualms about starting false religions for no reason, how can we believe anything? How do you know I'm right here? How do you know Allah is not deceiving you into thinking I'm right here? How do you know Muhammad existed and didn't just trick and deceive people into believing that Muhammad existed? Exactly. How do you know anything? How do we know anything if there is an omnipotent deceiver who tricks and deceives people into believing false things? <clears throat> Uh, that's scary. That's yep. scary. Uh, but that's exactly what Islam preaches about our belief. So those of you Muslims out there want to say, oh, your gospel's been corrupted. Guess what? I open up the gospel and it says Jesus died by crucifixion. Who corrupted that? Your God, according to what you believe.
according to what you believe, your God did that. He corrupted the scripture. Don't blame Paul. You can blame Paul for something else, not the crucifixion. That came from Allah, according to your belief. And that leads to the second point that I was mentioning. The Quran itself boasts in several passages that the best deceiver of them all, the one who's the greatest of all deceivers, is not Satan. Now, if you ask a Christian who loves the Lord Jesus Christ and believes that our God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, is a God of infinite truth, infinite holiness, and purity and perfection, who cannot lie, it's impossible for him to lie and deceive, and mislead. In fact, just for the people who are taking notes, you can write these passages down where the Bible is quite clear that it is impossible for a God who by nature is unchangeable, it's impossible for him to lie and deceive. Hebrews chapter 6, verses 17 to 18. You can write down Hebrews chapter 6, verses 17 to 18. Titus chapter 1, verse 2. Titus chapter 1, verse 2. And James chapter 1, verse 13. James 1, 13. Our Bible is quite clear. God cannot lie. Impossible for him to lie. Right? <clears throat> and because he's immutable, that his nature is unchangeable, he can only act consistently with what and who he is. And he is, he is righteous by nature. He is holy by nature. He's a God of truth. According to our scripture, the best of all deceivers would be Satan. In fact, in Revelation chapter 12, verse 9, Revelation chapter 12, verse 9, we are told that Satan, the devil, the ancient serpent, the dragon, Revelation 12, 9, he is the one who deceives the whole world. He's the one who misleads the whole world. However, when we come to the Quran, Muslims claim that the, the God of the Quran, Allah, is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Yet in the Quran, in chapter 3, verse 54, ironically, David, chapter 3, verse 54 is in the context of Allah causing Jesus to escape the plot of the Jews. It's that same context about the Jews plotting, scheming to kill Jesus. And so the Quran makes this statement. It says, they, chapter 3, verse 54, plotted, schemed, connived, right, aimed at deceit, mm -hmm. right? And Allah also plotted, schemed, connived, aimed at deceit. And the best of all deceivers is Allah. Khairun makirin. Allah is the best of all those who scheme, who connive, who tries to use deceit in order to accomplish a goal. The best of all those who use deception, the Quran says is Allah, not Satan. So although Satan is a deceiver according to the Quran, Allah is actually a better deceiver than Satan himself. That's chapter 3, verse 54 of the Quran, and chapter 8, verse 30. So the Quran is quite clear. Allah deceived people into thinking Jesus died because Allah is the best of all deceivers. He's a better deceiver than Satan himself, thereby foisting New Testament Christianity upon us. Yep. Uh, interesting position, my Muslim friends. Um, let's go, let, let's start uh, video clips here in just a second. Before we do, I want to give you an idea of the overall absurdity of Zakir Naik's position. Um, we'll be looking at some of the claims of the New Testament where Jesus claims over and over again that he was going up to Jerusalem to die by crucifixion and statements even after he went up to Jerusalem to die uh, from angels even, angels no less, claiming that he was dead. Let me just give you an idea. I'll quote two and we'll quote some more as we look at some of these video clips. Uh, but briefly, Matthew chapter 17, verse 22. And while they were gathering together in Galilee, Jesus said to them, the Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him. What's that, Sam? Hmm. They're going to uh, try to kill him, but God is going to replace Jesus with someone else, and then this other person is going to be crucified, or, or Jesus is going to be nailed to a cross, but he's going to uh, Swole, come yeah. back after getting a massage from Mary Magdalene <laughs> in the tomb. Yeah. Uh, is that what he says here? No, he says... And they will kill him, and he will be raised on the third day. So he's going to die, and then he's going to rise. Let me read one more. Uh, this is from chapter 20 of Matthew. I'm focusing on Matthew because Zachary Nike is going to focus a lot on Matthew. So I went to the book that he's going to be spending a lot of time on. In Matthew chapter 20, beginning at verse 18, Jesus said, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered to the chief priests and scribes, and they will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles to mock and scourge and crucify him, and on the third day he will be raised up. So Jesus makes these claims over and over again, and I said we'll, we'll, we'll read some more. But think about the absurdity of Zucker Nike's entire position. He's saying, I can go to the Bible and show that Jesus never died by crucifixion. We open up the Bible, it says over and over and over again that Jesus died by crucifixion. So what does Zakir mean? Well, what Zakir means is I can pull little things out of here and build absurd arguments off them and totally ignore 
the rest of what the New Testament said and what Jesus says. I'm going to cherry pick. I'm going to look for verses. I'm going to rip things out of context, and I'm going to support my position that way. Now, why this is so disturbing is if you try to do that with the Quran, if you try to cherry pick something out of the Quran, Zakhar Naik says, oh, you're taking it out of context. Watch in a couple weeks when we discuss Zakhar Naik's response to jihad. He's going to pick and choose things all the time, but he will not allow you to do that with the Quran. He will not allow anyone to quote a verse of the Quran without examining the context. And here he says, I'm going to the New Testament, which you've already seen, says quite plainly Jesus is going to die. And Zakhar Naik says, I'm going to build my case on that. Very. So from the start, from the start, Zakhar Naik is telling us, in effect, I'm going to go to a book that repeatedly declares Jesus died by crucifixion. And I'm going to prove that that book doesn't say it. This is, some, this is some, some twisted stuff here, and this gives you an idea. Think about it. Think about it, my Muslim friends. Who's the greatest of deceivers according to Islam? Allah. Allah is the greatest of deceivers. Even Jesus was in on the deception according to Ibn Abbas, according to Ibn Abbas from Muhammad. Right. Even, even Jesus was in on this deception. Now, if your prophets are deceivers, if your God is a deceiver, why would you expect someone like your champion debater to be honest and forthright with the text. Would you expect that? Of course not. No. These, th this, this is not a religion that promotes integrity when it comes to these sorts of things. Uh, so let's go ahead and watch our first video. We'll get an idea of Zakhar Naik's approach. So let's see the first video. The topic, was Christ really crucified? What is the meaning of the English word crucified? According to the Oxford Dictionary, Crucify means to put to death by fastening onto the cross. According to the Webster Dictionary, Crucify means to put to death by nailing or binding to the cross. In short, for a person to be crucified, he should die on the cross. If he does not die, he is not crucified. Now, uh, notice what Zucker Nike just did, because we, we said he's going to be leading out with deception, and that's exactly what he leads out with. Notice how he tries to define crucify. Yeah. He says, well, I open up a dictionary, it says to kill by nailing to a cross. <laughs> the question is not what, your, what your, uh, your, your dictionary today says, it's how the Bible is using this, right? Yeah. And the Bible use it for, uses it for nailing to a cross, right? Exactly. The Bible uses that. In fact, what did we just read? What did we just read? The very passage we just quoted from Matthew chapter 20. Jesus said, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered to the chief priests and scribes, and they will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles to mock and scourge and crucify him. And on the third day he will be raised up. Now, what does he mean by crucify? Well, let's go to Matthew chapter 27 and... It's describing the process of crucifixion. And notice, verse 35 says, And when they had crucified him, they divided up his garments among themselves by casting lots. And sitting down, they began to keep watch over him there. And above his head, they put, the sign, uh, they put up the charge against him, which read, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Jesus wasn't dead yet. The Bible says he was already crucified. Exactly. Wait a minute. Zucker Nike, he's going to base a good portion of his argument on the idea that if you don't actually die, you weren't crucified. And while I, I quoted a dictionary, that's not, we're, not, we're not talking about your dictionaries, Dr. Nike. We're, we're talking about what, how the Bible uses this term. Because the Bible is the book he says proves it. This proves his position. How does the Bible use crucify? Well, it's being nailed to a cross. You ultimately die from it, but it's the act of, of being nailed Precisely. to the cross. So right from the get-go, he doesn't define it according to the Bible. He defines it according to, um, according to a dictionary he got. And the reason he's doing that is... So that he can say, if Jesus survived, then he wasn't crucified, and I win the debate because Jesus wasn't actually crucified. Yeah. So we can change the meaning of the term in yeah. order to try and play around uh, yeah, with, I mean, with the uh, debate topic. Just hearing you repeat his argument really irks my spirit. It grieves me that someone would resort to that type of deception to deny what the Bible obviously and plainly teaches. Christ was crucified and died as a result of crucifixion. Uh, to say that he wasn't crucified because crucifixion somehow means that he didn't die, even that definition, let's just go with that definition. According to the same Lord Jesus Christ, the crucifixion would result in him being put to death. 
Because in that passage that you read, when you read Matthew chapter 20, Jesus says that he'll be handed over to be crucified and be raised on the third day. Now let me give you a parallel passage that shows you that the crucifixion of Christ inevitably results in his death, that he dies by a crucifixion. So even if we go by his definition, the Bible actually shows, shows that Jesus will be killed, die as a result of his crucifixion. Even though they're not synonymous, still one results into the other. Matthew 17, 22 to 23, same gospel he used. Now remember, if the Gospels are good enough to establish a Muslim's uh, position, then the Gospels are also good enough to expose and refute that particular argument. You can't have your cake and eat it too. You can't just choose those passages that you think support your position and ignore the other passages that provide clarity to the ones that you're using and refute your position and expose the blatant distortion of what the Bible teaches concerning issues such as the crucifixion. Matthew 17, 22 to 23. As they were gathering in Galilee... Jesus said to, to them, the Son of Man is about to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him. Can it get any plainer than that? If I kill you, does that mean you swoon and survive, and then you go and take up residence in a tomb, like in an apartment, and just kill, kick back? And, and he'll be raised on the third day, and they were greatly distir mm -hmm. distressed. So the crucifixion does result in Jesus being mm -hmm. put to death. Mm -hmm. He does die. He is killed by a crucifixion. So either way... Zachariah is refuted by Scripture. Mm -hmm. Even if we assume his definition is correct, mm -hmm. well, Jesus himself plainly says mm -hmm. the crucifixion results in Jesus being put to death inevitably. Mm -hmm. They will kill him by a crucifixion. Mm -hmm. I want to quote one more passage because this one comes from an angel. And why is this important? Well, Zachariah is going to make, uh, he's going to build his argument a lot on what happened after Jesus was put in the tomb. What happened? What happened after Jesus was put in the tomb? Well, an angel appears, and in Matthew chapter 28, verse 5, the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus, who has been crucified. He is not here, for he has risen, just as he said. Think about this. The angel. An angel. Don't you Muslims believe in, in, in angels? Don't you believe they speak the truth? Don't you believe what Jesus said? So Jesus said he's going up to Jerusalem to be crucified. The angel says he's already been crucified. Zachariah comes along and says, no, I'm going to prove from this text. Jesus wasn't crucified. <laughs> Total deception. You know, what, you know what's coming. You know what's coming. Now, let's continue. Let's go ahead to video uh, number two, and we'll see uh, how Zachar continues his case. Let's see what St. Paul has to say regarding resurrection. St. Paul, he comments on resurrected bodies. In the same chapter where he says, if Christ hasn't risen, our faith is in vain, our preaching is in vain. Same chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, towards the end of the chapter. St. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 42 to 44, he says that so also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption, it is raised in incorruption. It is sown. In dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. There's a natural body and there's a spiritual body. According to St. Paul, the resurrected bodies are spiritualized. They are spiritualized. Wow and double wow. <laughs> yeah. Here I can't figure out if He's actually trying to deceive people on this issue. There, there are areas where he's obviously, and I mean obviously, trying to deceive the audience. Here I can't figure out if he's really trying to deceive people or if he's just that completely, totally ignorant of what Christianity teaches. Yeah. Because he sounds like he just doesn't have a clue about what Christianity teaches, or Judaism teaches, about the resurrection of the dead. Now what would, how, how... I, I'm baffled by this because before I became a Christian, right? Yeah. Before I became a Christian, when I'm, looking, when I'm looking through the scriptures and stuff, I'm investigating these things, I understood, I understood that according to Christianity, resurrection is physical, right? Resurrection is resurrection of your physical body. Your physical body, the physical body that you have is perishable. It's ultimately winding down. It will eventually die. When God resurrects you, he resurrects your body. He empowers it and upholds it and sustains it by the power of the spirit. And this is what it's talking about, a spiritual body versus a natural body. The natural body is one that is corruptible. He even says it in the passage Zachariah just quoted. Uh, the resurrection body 
is not corruptible because it's been raised by the power of the Spirit. Exactly. And so, the, uh, th by the way, this is like half of his opening argument. He argues, based on the Apostle Paul saying that there's a spiritual body, that this means that at the resurrection you don't have a body, you're just a spirit. Well, the Apostle Paul would have said, what do you mean? I said body, didn't I? Precisely. I said body. There is no concept in Judaism of a spirit that is a body that is not physical. A body is physical, right? So if you want, as a Muslim want to believe something else, fine. That's not the position of Paul. That's not the position of the New Testament. That's not the position of Judaism. It's not, not the position of Christianity. You, your soul, can exist without your body. That's not the resurrection. That's not the resurrection. The resurrection is where God reunites your soul with your body raised up in power and glory. Is this correct or not? 100%. In fact, even what's ironic, not only does he quote the chapter which explains what Paul meant by spiritual body, Zechariah himself said it's spiritualized. And right there in saying it's spiritualized, he pretty much gets what Paul is trying to say. Mm -hmm. A spiritualized body is not something that's immaterial. It's not bodiless. It is a body, but it's under the dominion of the Holy Spirit. And let me just prove that this is what Paul was saying by simply continuing to read the rest of the context of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Now, he read 1 Corinthians chapter 15. He started verse 42. I'm going to read from verses 50 onwards. Mm -hmm. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 50 all the way to 58. And keep in mind, Zachary has to be aware of this passage, right? He's, He's quoting it. it. Yes, He's exactly. quoting it, and he not only, did, not only that, he has memorized it. Yeah. <laughs> he recited part of this chapter from memory. Yeah. He's obviously read it many times, and he knows what the rest of this passage says, right? Yep. Even, even, in, the, even in the part he quoted, where it... Yep. is referring to the body. And it says, it is sown, it is raised. It is that raised. Means it's that same the body. thing that sown is coming out, mm -hmm. right? I mean, it's quite clear. But yeah, here, but the rest of the just, passage, in case, yeah. just in case people didn't understand what Paul meant, it, it's the same body. There's a continuation between the body that is sown and the body that's raised. The difference is, the body, before it is raised and transformed, it is a body under the power and dominion of sin. It is a body prone to weakness. It is a body that decays. It is a body that experiences pain. It is a body that has sin in which there's a war going on between that sinful tendency in our body and our desire to submit to God. When it's raised, that will be eradicated. That body will become indestructible, immortal, no more sin to struggle with. That this is Paul's point. Here you go, 1 Corinthians 15, verses 50 to 58. I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Now, by flesh and blood, you'll see what he means in a minute. Nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for this perishable body, see, that's what it means, flesh and blood, a body prone to perish, decay, and die and wither. This perishable body must put on the imperishable. This mortal body, body that dies, must put on immortality. Did you catch it? It's this body. Notice he says, this body will be made imperishable. This body will be made immortal. So in other words, it's the same body. He says it right here. Mm -hmm. This perishable body must put on the imperishable. This mortal body must put on immortality, meaning that this body that's perishable will be made imperishable. So it's the same body. There's a continuation between the body that is sown and the body. It's the same body, but the difference is before it is transformed, before it is raised, this body is prone to sin, weakness, death, and decay. After the resurrection or after the transformation of believers, our bodies, same body, will now be made immortal, incorruptible, free of sin, pain, and decay. So it's the same body. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, Paul can't get any clearer mm -hmm. than that. Mm -hmm. All right, well, we have to take a break now, but I want everyone to think about this for a moment. Zachar Naik goes to the Gospels to show that Jesus didn't die by crucifixion. And we've already seen the Gospels maintain over and over and over again, Jesus died by crucifixion. Zachar Nike, in order to build an argument, goes to a passage in 1 Corinthians 15 to show that according to Christianity, when you are resurrected, you leave your body behind and you're just a spirit. If you keep reading, if you read even what he said, Especially if you keep reading the passage, you see Christianity maintains the exact opposite. The passage Zachar and I quoted says the exact opposite of what he's maintaining. There is no resurrection without the body. The resurrection involves the body. Zachar and I says, oh, but resurrection means you're just, you're just a ghost, right? You're a ghost. 
you've left your body. That's what, that's what Paul teaches there in 1 Corinthians 15. Yeah, unless you actually read it. But Zacharnik's listeners haven't read it, and they just listen to whatever he says, and what he says is flat out false. Now, just so you know, he builds, he builds a, a good portion of his argument based on his deception about 1 Corinthians 15. He says, ah, according to the Bible, if you're resurrected, you're just a spirit. You're just a disembodied spirit. But Jesus had a body after his resurrection, proving that he wasn't resurrected. Right? The, in, in the Gospels, when Jesus leaves the tomb, he has a body. He shows people the marks in his hands. He can eat. And so obviously, Jesus never rose from the dead because he has a body. And Christians look at this and say, how absurdly deceptive can you be? Do you have no concern for truth? It's almost like Zucker Nike is saying to Christians, I know that you know this is ridiculous. I know that you can see right through this, but watch how quickly I can deceive all of these ignorant people who don't know any better. Ha, look what I can do. And what would we expect from a man who defends the, a God who is the greatest of deceivers? Let's take a break. We'll be back in just a moment here on Jesus or Muhammad. Welcome back to Jesus or Muhammad. We are exploring the claims of Dr. Zakir Naik, one of the most popular Islamic apologists in history, one of the most popular Muslim debaters in the world, despite the fact that he has never stepped on stage with an experienced Christian debater. Somehow he got the reputation. But we are looking at maybe why he won't step on stage with an experienced debater. And the reason is, Anyone, any, any even, even halfway decent Christian debater would make Zucker Nike look so silly and ridiculous on stage that Zucker Nike focuses on going up and, and seeing if he can get a local pastor or a local evangelist rather than people who actually uh, spend quite a bit of time uh, defending the gospel through apologetics. So uh, we've, we've looked at several problems already. I want to go into this next clip because it's going to build on the last video we saw. We, we saw that Dr. Nike builds an, an argument on the claim that according to Christianity, when you are resurrected from the dead, when you are resurrected from the dead, your spirit goes on without your body and you're just a ghost. That is absolutely the opposite of what Christianity teaches. We saw in the exact same passage that Zucker Nike quoted, and we have to wonder, is he that deceived or is he that great of a deceiver? How do you read a passage which says over and over and over again that the resurrection is physical, it's a physical event, and then say, but this passage says that if, if you're resurrected, you're just a spirit, and then go on to claim that since Jesus had a body after his resurrection, which is exactly what Christianity teaches about the resurrection, therefore, he wasn't resurrected because he was more than just a spirit. So let's see what Zucker Nike does this. He, does, he, he uses a lot of these claims. Let's look at one here in the next video. It was the first day of the week that Mary Magdalene goes to the tomb. Now why should Mary Magdalene go to the tomb on the third day after Jesus Christ peace be upon supposedly was dead? Why should she go? The reply is given in the verse earlier, in the Gospel of Mark, chapter number 16, verse number 1, that Mary Magdalene goes to massage Jesus peace be upon him, to anoint him. The word is anoint, which the original Hebrew word is masaha means to massage, to rub, to anoint. Think about this, Sam. This, if this weren't just so, I mean, I mean, this is evil, right? At yeah. bottom, this is just evil. If this yeah. weren't so diabolically evil, this would be so humorous that he stands there on stage and says, right? How do you know? How do you know, Zachary Nike, that Jesus wasn't dead? Well, we go to 1 Corinthians 15, which says that if, you, if you're resurrected, you have a physical body, but somehow we're going to say, that according to 1 Corinthians 15, if you're resurrected, you're just a ghost. And then we show that since Mary Magdalene went to give Jesus a massage, yeah. therefore he must have had a body because you're not going to massage a ghost. Yeah. And since she went to give him a massage, he must have been alive after being crucified. Sam, uh, I'm sure many of our viewers have seen the Passion of the Christ. As far as the actual scourging, that's pretty accurate, ladies and gentlemen. That, that horrifying scene where Jesus is just whipped and lashed and his blood's going all over the place, that is a historically accurate representation of a scourging. We have records where people's intestines would spill out from one of these beatings, right? Because your flesh is just being ripped open, your guts would spill out of you. People would, around a quarter of the people who went through the crucifixion process would die just from the beating itself. That's how vicious these beatings were. 
And according to Zachary Nike, after going through all this, after being lashed across his front, across his, across his back, after his skin would be hanging in ribbons, after his muscles would be exposed, Jesus wants a good massage. Yeah, yeah. yeah it makes perfect sense. I'm ready to deny the crucifixion and embrace Islam. No, re no respect or concern whatsoever for yeah. truth or reality. Precisely. Just how can I trick and deceive this audience? Yeah, this that's, is some sick stuff. I just want to comment. Number one, the word for anoint doesn't come from Masaha. He's confusing the Arabic word because in Arabic, Jesus is called mm -hmm. Al-Masih. Mm -hmm. Masih, which uh, is supposed to be a cognate of the Hebrew word Mashiach. Now, again, some of the Muslims claim that the reason why Jesus is called Messiah is because he would uh, anoint with oil. I mean, because it can come from the word where it means to, to anoint, <clears throat> right? However, if you actually read, if you read the reason why Mary Magdalene came to anoint Jesus' body, you find the answer in the Gospels themselves. For example, if you go to just Luke chapter 23, and you read 49 all the way to 56. Again, for the sake of time, I'm just going to read the relevant portion. But for those of you taking notes, Luke 23, <clears throat> verses 49 to 56, here's why. Here's the answer why. Um, <clears throat> it was the day of preparation, the day when Jesus died on the cross. It was the day of preparation. And the Sabbath was beginning. The woman who had come with them from Galilee followed and saw the tomb and how his body was laid. Then they returned and prepared spices and ointments. On the Sabbath, they rested according to the commandment. The reason why they're coming after the Sabbath to anoint the body is not because they're going to massage him because somehow he's still alive. It's because they could not give him a proper burial because it was the Sabbath, so they had to rush through the process of burying the body and laying it in a tomb. So in honor of their rabbi, in honor of their teacher, they decided to go back and more thoroughly anoint the body and prepare it for burial out of respect for their master whom they thought was dead. That's the reason why they did it. Not to massage his muscles that don't even have skin on them anymore? <laughs> no, actually not. But you know what's ironic? The same Gospel of Mark prefigures what Mary Magdalene wanted to do with the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. And what, what do I mean? She went to anoint his body, right? But if you go to Mark chapter 14, verses 3 all the way to 9, notice this, Mark 14, 3 to 9. Let me read it because here it tells you that the anointing is not to massage a body that has survived this grotesque beating and crucifixion. The, the anointing is to give him a more proper burial. <clears throat> now let me read this, Mark 14, verses 3 to 9. While he was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, he was reclining at table. A woman came with an alabaster flask of ointment of pure nard, very costly, and she broke the flask and poured it over his head. There are some who said to themselves indignantly, why was the anointment wasted like that? For this ointment could have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor. And they scolded her. Now watch Jesus' response. But Jesus said, leave her alone. Why do you trouble her? She's done a beautiful thing to me. For always, you always have the poor with you, and whenever you want, you can go and do good for them. But you'll not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for burial. And truly I say to you, whoever the gospels proclaim in the whole world, what she has done will be to told in memory of her. Did you notice what, what he said? She's preparing me for burial, not massaging my body, because when I get crucified, I'm going to survive and swoon, and I need a good massage. Mm -hmm. She is doing this, anointing me, uses the same word, anointing my body for burial, mm -hmm. prefiguring his death on the cross and subsequent burial. And the reason why is because the woman would not be able to get to his body to give him a proper burial and anoint him, so she does it beforehand in advance. Mm -hmm. Same um, gospel. Uh, it, <laughs> If, and beyond that, right? So, so here we have to wonder, I mean, why, why would Zakhar say something so obviously deceptive? And I can only conclude that he, he counts on, he depends on the ignorance of his audience. He counts on, he depends on his audience not going, on, not going and looking up any of this, on just blindly trusting any random ridiculous thing he says. Uh, but a further sign of his ignorance can be seen even in what he just said there because he says he quotes he quotes the verse and he says and in the original hebrew yeah, exactly. what, what what original hebrew is there of <laughs> mark of <exactly>. mark yeah. <laughs> what original hebrew it was written in greek you don't even know what language mark was written in this is the level of of even of beyond that uh, it's, it's not even in hebrew it's and even he gets that right yeah so he gets it wrong, wrong right yeah. so every everything he says he's just it's, it's building one yeah. error and mistake on top of the other all right, well, we, we, we're about to get to uh, one of the, the most uh, important claims that he makes, not in terms of its, um, of its soundness or the, the strength of the argument, just, but ju just based on 
um, how much Muslims are, are using this response. But before we do, we want to take uh, a caller so that we don't end up building up a, a bunch of callers that we don't get to it in the end. Um, I think we have Isa on the line. Good evening, Sam, David. Good how to see you? you guys again. I get, to, I get to wish you a Merry Christmas before the end of the year. It's, war it's heartwarming to see you guys again. It's been a while. Good to see you, uh, brother. I'm calling on my behalf, on behalf of my ex-Muslim friend who's too scared to talk to you guys on the line. <laughs> my first comment is I, I take Zakat Knight as a mechanic as a, likes to take out the seat covers and the tires and the transmission to change the fuse on a car to, you know, to show off his expertise. I mean, you've got to keep in mind, most of these people listening to him don't even know what's in the Quran, not alone to tell us what's in the Bible. Yeah, exactly. And, the, other co and, and the, the comment my friend wants to make to you guys, keep up the good work. You are opening people's eyes. There's a lot of good Muslims with ears and hearts are listening. Amen. You're coming to the truth. Hallelujah. God bless you and keep you safe. Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Yes. And the Lord Jesus bless you, Isa, and your ex-Muslim friend. We pray in Jesus' name all Muslims become ex-Muslims and fall in love with Jesus. Keep praying for David and myself, for our spouses and children, for the power of the Holy Spirit to protect us, keep us safe, healthy, but more importantly, radically in love with Jesus, to become more holy, more righteous, more pure, and more like Jesus, because we do this for the sake of the Lord. As Paul said, we proclaim Christ as Lord and ourselves as servants for Christ's sake. We are your servants for the sake of Jesus. If it wasn't for Jesus, we wouldn't be here. So praise his holy name, because everything good comes from him. Because that's what the Bible says, and we thank our Lord Jesus for his faithfulness. <clears throat> Amen. Yeah, yeah thank Bye. you, brothers, and uh, we look forward to hearing from you again. Uh, we want to go to the next video clip now. Uh, we want to look at the next video where we're going to get into a very important topic, the sign of Jonah. Let's have the next video. Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 12, verse number 39 and 40 says, You evil and adulterous generation, seek it be after a sign. You seek for a miracle? No sign shall be given to you but the sign of Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the whale, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. All right, we're going to go ahead and, uh, and play the second video because it, he builds on the argument here in a second. Let's just be clear on the passage he's quoting. Zachar Naik is quoting Matthew. And the passages we read earlier, where Jesus says that he's going up to Jerusalem to die, and that he's going up to, be, up, up to Jerusalem to be crucified, and where the angel says, you're looking for Jesus, who has been crucified, and the, and the passage which says that Jesus was crucified while he was being crucified. Um, this is the book where Zachar Nike is going to quote the sign of Jonah, and he's going to say that according to this passage, Jesus is telling his followers that he wasn't going to be crucified. Now, now think about this. Are you telling me that Jesus is the all-time worst communicator in history? Does Jesus have some insane speech impediment where he goes up to his followers and says, I'm going up to Jerusalem to die. They're going to crucify me. And after I've been killed, I'm going to rise from the dead. And then turns right around and says, oh, but just as Jonah was swallowed. I'm going to survive, and just as Jonah survived, I'm going to live on, and uh, I'm not going to be crucified at all, and I'm not going to die. <laughs> do you is that what you really believe? Yeah. How do you do that? The most basic, the most basic fundamental rule of Scripture interpretation is you read in context. If you somehow read this sign of Jonah, and you conclude something that contradicts everything else Jesus says in the entire book, then obviously you've got a major problem with your interpretation. Yeah. Whereas if you read this and you come up with an interpretation that lines up perfectly with everything else Jesus said, you're probably right on the money. Uh, but let's look at the next video clip where uh, Zachary Naik is going to show us where he's going with this. We want to we wanna, we wanna give Zachary Naik his time to speak, uh, and let's see what he's going to do with this. Next video clip. When Jonah was thrown overboard, was he dead or was he alive? Alive. The fish comes and follows him. Was he dead or alive? Alive. He prays to Almighty God from the belly of the whale. Was he dead or alive? Do dead men pray? Was he dead or alive? Alive. The whale takes Jonah three days and three nights in the ocean. Dead or alive? Alive. 
fish vomits him out on the seashore. Was he dead or alive? Alive. Alive, 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 alive. Now, how many problems are there oh, with this argument? You want to start? Yeah. Um, so, but, but obviously, we, we just pointed out one of the most glaring problems, namely, it contradicts everything else Jesus says in the Gospels. Jesus says over and over, and we only read a couple of them, there are more. Jesus says over and over to his followers, I'm going up to Jerusalem to die. And then yes. after he died, the angel said, you're looking for Jesus who's been crucified. Exactly. If you're telling me Jesus is saying the opposite of that here, You've got some issues with your interpretation, not me, because I'm not going to interpret it that way. And by the way, I wouldn't do that with the Quran either. I wouldn't do that with the Quran. I wouldn't treat your Quran like that. We try to be accurate when we handle the Quran. Yes. We would like it if your most experienced uh, apologist did the same, but they just don't. Now, yeah, what else do we have? In the first place, and again, I trust in the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ to help us to speak to these issues accurately. Because when you said we try to represent the Quran accurately, that's what we try to do. And at times we'll fail because we're imperfect. But it's not our intention to distort the Quran. But it's clear that Zechariah and others like him, it seems that they're intentionally distorting the Bible to their own destruction because they don't respect the Bible. Now, I don't believe in Islam, but at, at least I'm going to respect Muslims enough to try to treat their text fairly and show them that their text <clears throat> is, is full of irreconcilable problems and that they need to turn to Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Now, number one, the focus on the analogy, the comparison between Jonah and Jesus, is not so much the condition of Jonah. And I'll get back to that, and we'll look at what the book of Jonah actually says, because there's actually some debate whether Jonah was alive or was he dead. But I'll get to that. What's, what, what Jesus is focusing on is not so much the condition of Jonah, but the time period that Jonah remained in the belly of the whale. He's talking about the time period being similar, that Jonah was in the belly of the whale for three days and three nights, Likewise, the Son of Man will be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. So the focus is on the time period, not so much the condition of Jonah and, and the condition of the Lord Jesus Christ, whether one was alive or the other is dead. And that's clear just by reading Matthew 12, 40. Let me read it. The point is the time period. That's what makes the two events similar. Not so much the condition that one was alive and the other dead. That's not the point. It's the time period. Let me show you, Matthew 12, 40. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights. You see the emphasis? Just as Jonah was in the belly of the great fish, the whale, for three days and three nights, so too will the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. That Jesus is focusing on the time frame, the length of time that he'll be in the heart of the earth, similar to the length of time that Jonah was in the heart of the belly, right, the belly of the whale, and not so much the condition, is reiterated by Matthew 16, where Jesus again mentions the sign of Jonah in the same context where he mentions the fact that he will be killed and be raised on the third day. Matthew 16, verses 1 to 4. Matthew 16, verses 1 to 4. The Pharisees and Sadducees came to test him, and they asked him to show them a sign from heaven. He answered them, When it is evening, you say it will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning it will be storm today, for the sky is red and threatening. You know how to interpret the appearance of the sky, but you cannot interpret the signs of the times. An evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah. So he left them and departed. That's Matthew 16, verses 1 to 4. That's the same chapter where Jesus goes on to later say to the disciples the following. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. That's Matthew 16, verse 21. Same chapter where he mentions the sign of Jonah is the same chapter where he reiterates the fact that he will be killed and be raised on the third day. So clearly, Jesus' point is not on the condition of Jonah, whether he's dead or alive, but the time in which Jesus would be entombed, which would be similar to the time in which Jonah was entombed in the belly of the whale. So that's the first point. Now, as you pointed out, even in the very same chapter, Jesus says, as clearly as he could say anything, that he's going up to Jerusalem to die. If your interpretation of a passage doesn't even fit with what Jesus says in the exact same chapter, what, what kind of interpretation skills do you have? Yeah. yeah. So there, 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 are basically, there are basically two possibilities here, right? Either Jonah was alive or he was dead yes. in the whale, right? If he was alive... If he was alive, then what would Jesus mean, right? Where, 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 would, where would the analogy be in addition to the things that Sam said? Well, if we're talking about what is this miraculous sign, 
if you get swallowed by a whale, you're not coming out, exactly. right? You're not coming back out. <laughs> yeah. And the analogy would be, if you are dead, he talks about the heart of the earth. Biblically, heart of the earth is Sheol. That's where you go when you die. If you go, if you come, if you are dead, you're not coming back out, right? If you die, you're not coming back out. At least not until the day of resurrection. Yeah, and, and, and here's the thing. If you get swallowed by a whale, you're not coming out without a miracle. Exactly. And if you are swallowed by death, you're not coming out without a miracle. You Muslims want to say, oh, no, that's not, that's not what it means. And you just want to stomp your foot and say, no, he's saying he's not going to die. But the problem is your, what you're saying totally contradicts the rest of what Jesus says, even in the exact same chapter. Why would you cling to a, to a position that doesn't fit with what Jesus said in the exact same chapter? And two... It doesn't even fit with Islam, right? It's not like they're, they're clinging to this position because Islam teaches it. Islam teaches Jesus was never crucified. He was never nailed to a cross. And Zachar Naik wants to main, maintain that according to the Bible, Jesus was saying that, yes, he was nailed to a cross. Yes, he was put in the tomb, but he came out three days later. Zachar Naik is clinging to a position that contradicts the Bible and contradicts the Quran. And Muslims will just stomp their feet and say, no, that's what he's saying. Why? Because you're that desperate, my Muslim friends. That's right. how desperate you are. And it's just silly. So if Jonah survived, right? Yeah. If he was alive throughout that process, as Zachar Naik maintains, then the analogy with Jesus wouldn't be there, right? Exactly. It would just be if you go in to the fish, you're not coming out. Yep. And according, and if you are swallowed by death, you're not coming back out, apart from, mirror, apart from something That's miraculous. But is that the only interpretation? Because no, I, I, yeah. I, I, was, I was having a debate on this one day, and a Messianic Jew came up to me afterwards, and he says, what do you mean J Jonah didn't die? What do you mean yeah, he was precisely. alive inside the whale? Yeah, what do you mean? What are you talking yeah, about? And that, in fact, that's the thing. Um, many Christians may not be aware of this, but I'm sure those who have studied the issue may already know this, so I may be preaching to the choir to some of you. But for the sake of those who don't know this, there's some indication that Jonah actually died when the whale swallowed, swallowed him, or the great fish. If you want to say it's a whale or great fish, be that as it may, be that as it may, it was a huge sea creature that swallowed him by direct command of God. That tells you something. Jonah was ordered by God to go to Nineveh, actually my ancestors. Now looking at me, you see why he hesitated, right? Mm -hmm. if, if, yes. you, if they looked like me, you'd see why no one would want to preach them. Absolutely. But glory I to would, Jesus Christ, glory to the Lord, he doesn't <laughs> care how we look. Just because we're stunningly beautiful and there are people like David who may hate us, hey, praise the Lord, he still loves us enough to give us the message of salvation. But Jonah didn't want to go, so he broke the commands of God. And yet here is a great sea creature who, when God commands it, perfectly and immediately obeys. Unlike someone who's created an image of God to represent God to the nations. Now, let me read the relevant portions of Jonah. I'm going to read Jonah chapter 1, verse 17. And then you can actually read Jonah chapter 2, verses 1 to 10. But for the sake of time, I'm not going to read all of it. I'm going to just read some of the verses from Jonah chapter 2. But let me start with Jonah 1, 17. Jonah 1, 17 says this. And Yahweh appointed a great fi fish, a sea creature, a whale, whatever it is, to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. This is where the Lord Jesus Christ got this from, Jonah 1.17. But now let's see what Jonah said while he was entombed in the belly of this great fish. Jonah chapter 2, verses 1 to 10. I don't have time to read all of it, but I'll read the salient points. Jonah chapter 2, verses 1 to 10. Then Jonah prayed to Yahweh his God from the belly of the fish, saying... I called out to Yahweh out of my distress, and he answered me, out of the belly of Sheol. That's the place of the dead, right? Exactly. That's where the dead go. Sheol can mean the grave, or it can mean the netherworld, where disembodied spirits go to awaiting the resurrection. Obviously, it can't mean the grave here, because he's not buried in a tomb. So this is why some expositors <clears throat> have concluded that here he was speaking from Sheol, that he actually died, his spirit left, went to Sheol, and from Sheol he cried out to God, and God raised him back from the dead, reuniting his spirit with his body, commanding the, the great fish to vomit out the body so that Jonah was alive again. So if that's the case, that means there's a perfect analogy with Jesus. Jonah, like Jesus, died. And Jonah, like Jesus, went to Sheol. At least their spirits did. And Jonah, like Jesus, was raised on the third day by having his spirit reunited with his body and being resurrected body and soul together, exactly like the Lord Jesus Christ. And let me just finish this part. Because this, too, is relevant to the point we're making, right? <clears throat> Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me, and all your waves and your billows passed over me. Then I said, I'm driven away from your sight, yet I shall again look upon your holy temple. 
The waters closed in over me to take my life, right? The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped around, around about my head. At the roots of the mountains, I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever. Did you catch it? Went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever. A perfect description of Sheol, the netherworld. Yet you brought up my life from the pit, O Yahweh my God. When my life was fainting away, I remembered Yahweh and my prayer came to you. Did you catch it? He's claiming that during that time, he went into the land whose bars imprisoned people. Well, that is a perfect description of the netherworld, what we call Sheol, which in Greek is called Hades or Hades. So you can actually make a strong case. Jonah did die and miraculously was raised back to life as a fitting analogy with the Lord Jesus Christ, who also died physically, who's also, who also went to Sheol, and then on the third day was raised immortal, his soul and body being reunited again. Mm -hmm. So if Jonah was alive throughout the entire process, it's clear what Jesus meant, if you want to interpret it in the light of everything else he says in the book of Matthew. And the alternative is that when Jonah says he was in Sheol, he actually meant it. He was dead and was miraculously raised, in which case, if Zachar Naik wants to hold us to a perfect analogy, then well, yeah. fine, fine. You still, don't, you still don't get anywhere in here. Jesus never died, and he was telling his followers in very strange metaphorical language that he wasn't going to die, thereby contradicting everything else he says in the entire book. I just wanted to add one more point. We have to take a break. Um, Sam quoted towards the end of Matthew chapter 16, where Jesus repeats the sign of Jonah. Sam quoted what Jesus said here, and I'm pointing this out because Zachar Nike is familiar with this, and he knows what this passage says. He knows what this passage says. Now let's listen to, let's continue reading. So Matthew chapter 16, where Jesus mentions the sign of Jonah, has to be, whatever he says there has to be consistent with what he's saying in the rest of the chapter. We read, beginning in verse 21, From that time Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised up on the third day. So he's going to be killed, he's going to be raised up. But someone objects and says, no, 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 we can't allow this to happen. This will never happen. Watch what happens. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. This is Peter rebuking Jesus because Peter didn't have a concept of a dying Messiah, right? Jesus is going to be victorious. He's going to conquer everyone. He's not going to die. Uh, watch what Peter says. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord, this shall never happen to you. What shall never happen to you? You're not going to go up to Jerusalem. You're not going to die. This isn't going to happen to you. What does Jesus say? But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for you are not setting your mind on God's interests, but man's. What is Jesus saying here? Peter, by opposing the work I'm about to do, you have unwittingly joined Satan who opposes my work. Right? I have a mission. Satan doesn't know all the details about what I'm going to do, but he is in opposition to me, and you're joining him by saying that I'm not going to go fulfill my work. Does Zachar Nike know that in the very same chapter where Jesus offers the sign of Jonah, he also says that to resist, to oppose his death on a cross is satanic. The Muslim view, according to Jesus, in the same chapter where Jesus offers the sign of Jonah, Jesus calls the Muslim view satanic. And yet a Muslim will look at all of this. And you Muslims watching this, I know there, I know there are some, as, as a brother just pointed out on the phone, I know there are some of you who are concerned with the truth. And you should be going out, you should be losing your mind right now that your apologist, someone like Zachar Nike, has blasphemed in this way, deliberately blasphemed. Has he read this? Yes. Does he know that Jesus says that the Muslim view is satanic? Absolutely. Zachar Nike knows that. And he gets up and tells his audience the exact opposite. Jesus proclaimed that he wasn't going to die, a view which Jesus calls satanic. That's what your apologists do. So for those of you out there who are concerned, in the truth, are concerned about truth, you should be looking at this going, wow, that's what our greatest apologists do to texts like the Bible. Those of you who aren't concerned about truth, not much I can do because you're going to stubbornly continue believing whatever Zachar Nike says, no matter how blasphemous, no matter how absurd, no matter how illogical, no matter how hypocritical, no matter how contrary to everything remotely resembling basic scripture interpretation.